Dr. Tatum, are you able to uh, let me know if you guys can hear me and see my slides? Yep, I can hear you good, and I can see your slides if you want to uh, cycle through and see if it goes. Oh, awesome. You are there. Sorry, I didn't see you. Uh, working okay for you? Yep, it's good. Awesome. Um, you want me to go right at noon? You want me to give people a couple minutes? I think we'll start right at noon because so that we don't cut into um, the the following lectures. Okay, sounds good. Cool. Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, so I'm going to get started at noon because this is a relatively packed lecture. Um, we're going to try to stay on schedule here today. Um, Dan, you can cut me off if I go long. I've been watching the time. The only thing I can't see is for some reason I can't get the chat up. So uh, if anybody has any questions, uh, Dan, if you just let me know and I'm happy to stop at any time or feel free to unmute yourself and just cut me off and ask. Uh, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm Andrew Pissanet. I'm uh, one of the new uh, division of uh, pulmonary and critical care staff physicians. And I was asked today to talk about, uh, in, excuse me, non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring. Um, so moving away from invasiveness has been a trend since the Pac-Man trial and, and similar trials, going away from PA catheter, more to arterial lines and central lines. Um, and now we're getting less and less invasive to the point that uh, we don't even have to insert any um, lines at this point uh, in, in some patients and in some instances. So I was asked to kind of give us a review of where we've been and uh, where we're going. My disclosures, I uh, will be using some brand name products, things like that. I have no uh, affiliation with any of them. Uh, I'm just using them because they're common and we see them in our hospital. Uh, the other thing I would say is I am by no means a uh, expert in this. I was a relative novice when I started looking this up. Um, there's probably some in the, uh, uh, the audience who are what I would consider lifelong masters of resuscitation. I'm happy to have any of you guys add any comments or any clarifications as I go along. Uh, I did do a literature search via a Sladen librarian for every topic that I'm about to talk about. So I believe it's mostly up to date and complete, uh, although this is a very new and ever changing uh, body of literature. So there may have been new published studies since I started working on this lecture in January. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is that anybody who knows me knows I like to lecture a little bit more loosely and less formally in these type of situations. Uh, unfortunately, with uh, our remote uh, learning, this is not as often possible. Um, so in some cases, I've reverted to more um, kind of standard formal uh, lecturing, but I hope to keep this loose. I want anybody who feels comfortable to unmute themselves, ask questions, um, and try to uh, keep this as uh, uh, cordial as it used to be when we were able to meet in person. Um, other than that, we'll get started. <clears throat> so what we will do today, uh, we will specifically be discussing the assessment of fluid responsiveness. Uh, primarily in the ICU, there will be a little bit of OR literature as well, um, but specifically we'll be looking at fluid responsiveness. We will not be discussing other hemodynamic assessments like ionotropy, systemic vascular resistance, or numerous other things that you might care about uh, as far as a hemodynamic assessment. Uh, the literature base for fluid assessment alone is just too large and we don't have time to go through everything. 
I will introduce novel techniques, skipping over the ones that aren't particularly well evidence-based right now, but probably are potentially the wave of the future. And I'll spend more time on what is currently kind of standard of practice, has good evidence base behind it, and is likely to uh, show up on the boards for the fellows. I will try my very best not to overwhelm in detail. I will say in full candor that I spent about three months on this and it is a web of literature that goes from one cool idea to the next. I've tried to distill it down to uh, the most important meta-analyses and the things that are probably most uh, useful in this day and age and what likely will be uh, useful in the next coming years. Uh, I will characterize the new techniques the physiology behind them, and most specifically their limitations, um, because the limitations are very important with these non-invasive techniques. Uh, we will not be discussing right heart failure or structural heart disease. Uh, so throughout this whole topic, uh, you can basically assume that what I am talking about does not apply to such patients where PA caths and more invasive uh, monitoring is often indicated. I will provide, like I said, current trends and likely board answers for the fellows or anybody recertifying, but I will by no means uh, be promising practice pattern five years from now. Um, so for our novel minimally invasive techniques, we have uh, a number. There's pulse contour analysis, which is measured by uh, various modalities, radial artery, applination tonometry, volume clamp method, and arterial lines. There's also concepts of pulse wave transit time, bioimpedance or bioreactants, and then partial carbon dioxide rebreathy. These are the bucket of things that I would say that I would be remiss if I didn't at least mention them, but we're gonna breeze through them real quickly because they're probably not ready for prime time, okay? Uh, for all non-invasive technologies, a validation studies using uh, bolus thermal dilution as a reference method has given conflicted results when applied to uh, all of these measurements. Uh, more specifically, in Europe, the uh, cardiovascular dynamics section of the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine came out with a statement that basically said these completely non-invasive methods are not currently recommended for the estimation of cardiac output in patients with circulatory shock, um, and many believe the same in the United States. More specifically in the MICU with abnormal vasomotor tone, uh, especially in our septic patients, uh, the accuracy of these methods is probably less than in your general ICU population that doesn't have poor uh, vascular resistance. Uh, but I will say that a lot of this is actually coming out of the perioperative uh, arena and probably is the future there or even ready for prime time in that arena uh, at this time. So any of our anesthesia critical care colleagues who may be joining us may actually be using these things on a regular basis, um, whereas we in the MICU tend not to. I will say that these uh, technologies continue to be refined with further software versions that make them better and better and better, uh, especially the pulse contour analysis software that we'll go through. Uh, and when we unleash things like artificial intelligence on these, uh, it's very possible that these could improve accuracy and definitely be the wave of the future. Uh, the other thing I would mention is that although these are less invasive and studies say often less accurate, with a percentage error of about 40%, which is typically felt to be uh, inadequate for accurate uh, estimation, estimation of cardiac output. The bar there usually uh, put at a percentage error of about 30%. I will say that there is literature that even though the absolute value of the cardiac output might not be correct, maybe the machine says, oh, the cardiac output is 3.8, when in reality it's 4.2, uh, that may be inaccurate, but the trend when you do things like volume expansion or passive leg raise, there is much better data that despite the inaccuracy in giving an accurate cardiac output, it will give you an accurate trend in cardiac output. And you'll see that happen uh, throughout our lecture uh, with some of these modalities. So not used for absolute cardiac output, but are used for trends. So very briefly, uh, pulse contour analysis. Long story short, if you go right to the middle here, uh, and can you all uh, see my pointer, by the way? Yeah, you can. Yes, okay, perfect. Uh, if you go right to the middle, uh, oh, that's gonna bring up, uh, sorry, one second. Um, 
what pulse contour analysis is, is essentially converting a pressure signal into a flow signal via proprietary algorithms that the companies have created. Uh, and it, it estimates cardiac output using the arterial pressure waveform characteristics and patient biometric and uh, demographic data. So you can get these pressure waveforms a number of ways. We're most used to the bottom here where we put in an arterial catheter and hook it up to a flow track system, um, which we attach to the Vigileo at Henry Ford Hospital. But uh, people are getting less and less invasive with radial artery um, applimation tonometry. You basically put a tonometer over the radial artery and uh, you put some mild pressure to flatten the artery. Therefore, the pressure of the artery is transmitted directly from the vessel to the sensor or the strain gauge, and it's digitally recorded and created into one of these flow uh, uh, patterns or pulse contour patterns. Another interesting technology that requires just a finger clamp, very similar to a pulse oximeter, uh, measures blood volume via a light detector. So this light detector uh, measures the blood volume and this clamp around it keeps the blood volume constant um, using the um, light source and the detector. So how does it keep it constant? Basically this little cuff on the finger inflates during systole, it deflates during diastole, and because the blood volume is held constant, therefore the cuff pressure then would equal the arterial pressure. Uh, and that again, will give you a pulse contour uh, wave that then the proprietary algorithm can convert into a cardiac output. All of these measurements can be either calibrated against a true thermodilution method, if you would like, or uncalibrated. What we're most used to at Henry Ford, of course, is the flow track sensor hooked up to the Vigileo. So we're used to seeing our cardiac output uh, on something like this. Again, usually hooked up to a uh, art radial artery catheter. Um, however, the wave of the future may be very soon doing something like this, much less invasive, um, but potentially in the future as accurate. Pulse contour analysis is something that we are using with arterial lines. So I'm gonna take just a quick second to talk about it. Um, and again, I had already mentioned, but when we look at the accuracy uh, and the precision of cardiac output measurements, the most commonly quoted criteria for acceptable uh, agreement with the standard thermodilution method is a percentage error of 30% or less. Um, so there was a meta-analysis done uh, of 65 validation studies with over 2,000 patients and over 45,000 observations uh, where they compared pulse wave analysis with thermodilution. Uh, long story short, with each generation of the software, it gets better. Uh, this data here is for the third generation of the software from the FlowTrack Vigileo software set. Uh, and you'll see that it's pretty good actually in generally critically ill patients and surgical patients with a, a decent precision and a percent error that is lower than the 30% threshold that we need for cardiac output monitoring. Unfortunately, where it's poor is, that, again, people with low vascular tone, so the people we treat very commonly, the people with sepsis and liver disease, the precision is much lower, you can see, and the percent error is well above that 30% threshold. Additionally, arrhythmia is not so well taken care of uh, or so well imputed by the uh, software. Um, and so those are uh, current limitations. There is a fourth generation software out already. Data still shows it's probably not ready for prime time where we work, but is potentially ready for people uh, that are generally critically ill without poor vasomotor turn, excuse me, vasomotor tone or uh, surgical patients. Um, again, this all uh, relies on a good pulse wave analysis. So anything that makes the arterial line or these other pressure tonometers uh, inaccurate uh, will lead to inaccurate cardiac output. Uh, that's a lecture in its own right as far as uh, things that can make the arterial line uh, less than accurate. Uh, but that's something to bear in mind when using pulse contour analysis. Uh, and I would like to just highlight that again, even though the absolute value of the cardiac output may not be particularly accurate, we are able to track changes very accurately in cardiac output, especially after uh, volume challenges. Uh, pulse wave transit time is something that's gaining some traction. Uh, basically, it is looking at the time that it takes a pulse wave to travel between two arterial sites. And what we do is we measure uh, from the peak of the R wave on the EKG to the pulse wave rise point. And if you basically measure the length from uh, the fingertip to the heart, you then have a time over a distance and you can get a rate 
and using proprietary software, uh, you can then uh, take the integral of that and essentially get a estimated cardiac output. Uh, the screen for one of the commercially available products that does this would look something like this, where you have your pulse wave here, your EKG here, and then your pulse transit time nicely recorded for you right here. The machine will just take these numbers and actually spit out a cardiac output um, somewhere toward the top for you. Um, again, not ready for prime time for us, but just so you've heard about it, because there's a lot of uh, buzz for this. Bioimpedance bioreactants, again, probably not ready for prime time, but a lot of buzz. Um, long story short, it is based on uh, resistance or impedance as you shoot electricity uh, through the thorax. Okay, so you'll have a set that uh, puts a um, electrical pulse of known amplitude and frequency through one electrode, pass it through the thorax, and then be sensed on the other side of the thorax. The crux of this is that blood and plasma conduct electricity very well. So they have low resistance and they have low impedance. Uh, whereas tissue and air are not very good at conducting electricity, therefore they have higher resistance and higher impedance. You take the voltage change against the thorax, or excuse me, across the thorax, knowing that blood and plasma conducts it uh, quicker. And what you look at then is a rate of change of impedance. Uh, the rate of change of impedance basically correlates to the blood flow through the aorta. So as the uh, blood goes through the aorta during a, a systolic event, your rate of or your impedance will go down because there's more blood with less resistance coursing through the thorax at that time. Therefore, your impedance will go down, your rate of impedance will go down, and you can use a formula, essentially a derivative, uh, excuse me, an integral of a derivative uh, that will give you the cardiac output. I don't want to go much deeper in, into detail than that, um, but this is essentially what it ends up looking like. And the computer will do a lot of this for you, but you can basically break the patient down into different um, uh, buckets of uh, tissue and water. And what you're looking for essentially is the change in your extracellular water, which should theoretically be uh, more or less the water inside of your vasculature. You're going to see how that changes uh, in volume with each heartbeat that uh, shoots blood through the aorta um, and then is tracked via these changes in impedance. This is uh, going to come back at, at one point later in the lecture, uh, but more or less it's, it's still probably uh, not ready for prime time. We're not using it at Henry Ford that I'm aware of. And then the last thing that's generating a lot of buzz um, is partial carbon dioxide rebreathing. Uh, the thought here is that uh, you can have your, um, the carbon dioxide that is uh, expelled um, measured via a rebreathing volume chamber. And what we want to do is essentially change the thick equation that we use with oxygenation for cardiac output. We we'll make a uh, thick equation instead using carbon dioxide that will work more or less the same to give us a cardiac output. Um, so how do you set it up? And then we'll go through uh, very briefly the theory behind it. You set it up by uh, having a patient uh, breathe into a uh, rebreathing chamber. At first, you leave it inactive. So the patient produces uh, the VCO2 or the carbon dioxide produced. It stays in the chamber. The patient does not rebreathe it. Uh, you measure the VCO2 uh, via the sensor here, and it's elevated, obviously. Once you allow the patient to rebreathe this volume, he's going to suck some of that volume back into his body. Therefore, the created carbon dioxide will be lower in the tube, and you'll see your VCO2 measurement goes down. When you're rebreathing carbon dioxide, of course, you're going to have the uh, partial pressure of carbon dioxide in your blood and your expelled um, and tidal CO2 go up. So while you're rebreathing, uh, unlike the VCO2, which decreases, you'll see the PET CO2, excuse me, or just the, the end tidal CO2, I should say, go up. And you'll be able to see a relative change in both of those. Once you allow them uh, to stop rebreathing, it goes back to normal. So what do you do with this? We're not gonna go through it, but I put it here for anybody who's interested, is this is your classic Fick equation. You change it, so now you're looking at carbon dioxide instead of oxygen. You do a set of uh, algebra here, add partial rebreathing, 
And at the end of the day, your cardiac output basically is equal to the decreased VCO2 over the increased uh, content of arterial carbon dioxide. What it looks like in real life, here's a monitor. Here's where the rebreathing volume is inactive. The person starts rebreathing, and so the VCO2 in that rebreathing chamber goes down. And then when they're rebreathing, of course, their end tidal CO2 goes up. You take this delta over this delta, and you actually get a um, cardiac output. Uh, I would not worry about the math too much, but the theory behind it is something that's probably worth mentioning because there's a lot of buzz about partial carbon dioxide rebreathing in the literature at this time. Um, what else is out there? Uh, well, big data is changing basically everything we do. Um, and it's one of the waves of the future. Um, applying this to uh, these types of modalities, again, is only going to improve them. Uh, predictive anal uh, excuse me, predictive analytics are already being done as with the uh, recurrent uh, software versions that the Vigileo flow track system is using, getting better and better with each uh, software output as they further refine the proprietary algorithms that turn pulse contour analysis into cardiac output estimates. Uh, and then artificial intelligence uh, is kind of the, the thing that everybody's thinking about these days. Um, you know, I know several uh, pathologists and radiologists who are up to date on this worried that they, their jobs might be lost to artificial intelligence. Um, I think uh, we all remember Ash gave a great lecture on this two years ago, one of our former fellows, um, where he kind of showed us what's happening and kind of where we're going with artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, but I would say that uh, while we sometimes think of this as like a theoretical, you know, way down the line type of a thing, um, maybe more suited to like radiology and pathology where clear slides and clear patterns can be re recognized. Um, I will say that it is uh, coming into the uh, hemodynamic resuscitation uh, arena. The October 2018 anesthesiology journal actually dedicated their entire October journal to AI. Uh, and they had uh, numerous publications as to how it's being used. Just one impressive example is they uh, basically unleashed AI on uh, arterial waveform patterns from 1,700 patients. They had 13,000 hypotensive events and 12,000 non-hypotensive events. They allowed the computer and the uh, AI to essentially uh, separate the arterial waveform into five phases. It was able to ID over 3,000 waveform features. We combined that with over the five phases. There were 2.6 million waveform features that the AI basically reduced down to 51 base features. A then created an internal uh, validation cohort that was subsequently externally validated. And it was able to predict hypotension 15 minutes before the hypotensive event with a sensitivity of 88%, specificity of 87%, and an area under the curve of 0.95. The data was even better at 10 and five minutes. And so this was able to predict hypotension before it occurred, basically allowing for proactive medicine rather than reactive medicine in the anesthesia suite. Um, so this is powerful stuff and it's already here. And I think it's gonna bring these non-invasive techniques uh, potentially uh, into a more reliable and more mainstream um, uh, arena. All right. And sorry, this is just uh, big data showing our, our surge in data. So we're going to be stopping with all of these waves of the new future. Uh, and what I'm going to be doing now is moving into what I'd like the crux of our uh, lecture to be, uh, which is what we're doing now and what has some evidence base uh, behind it currently. Um, what we won't be doing today is looking at any of these determinants of cardiac output. And the only thing we're going to be looking at is preload. Okay, again, is giving fluid to my patient potentially going to be able to help my patient? Um, and how is this going to affect their stroke volume and cardiac output? We're not getting anywhere near the supply independent phase or critical DO2. All we're doing is assessing fluid responsiveness. And the assumption here is that we've already acutely resuscitated anybody who's clearly hypovolemic or in the initial stages of sepsis. Um, so the people who've already gotten their 30 cc per kg bolus, and we're trying to decide, um, should we give more fluids? We know that fluids are a cornerstone of acute circulatory failure. 
But we also know in the ICU that after that initial resuscitation phase, many are fluid non-responders. Uh, as many as 50% of hemodynamically unstable ICU patients are non-responders. That's borne out throughout the multiple studies that we'll go through here today. Um, we know that repeated boluses risk fluid overload, and I don't have to convince you that that leads to bad outcomes like hemodilution, increased cardiac healing pressures, prolonged mechanical ventilation, increases the mortality of generally critical ill patients, um, and even more specifically patients with sepsis, ARDS, intra-abdominal hypertension, and AKI. So our question today is to bolus or not to bolus? You think after ignoring ionotropy afterload, all those things, that this would be a pretty easy question to answer. Uh, I think Merrick put it quite well uh, when he said that the clinical assessment of intravascular volume status and volume responsiveness is actually one of the most difficult tasks in critical care medicine. Uh, and I uh, wholeheartedly agree after preparing this lecture. I would say vetting the literature behind it is even more difficult potentially uh, because the variation in patient populations that are studied, is it OR, is it ICU? Are they prone, are they supine, are they ARDS? Are they with normal lung function? Uh, do they have heart failure? The heterogeneity of these studies that are, stud uh, that are looked at is, is very wide. There are a ton of methods, some of which I've already described and uh, some that we're about to talk about. And some of those methods can be calibrated or uncalibrated. Uh, there are also various caveats, inclusion and exclusion criteria that are specifically used to kind of optimize the areas under the receiver operating curves for a lot of these studies. Um, and so they come with several caveats. Uh, even what is a fluid challenge? Do you use 100 cc's, 500 cc's, a liter? Do you use passive leg raise? Do you use colloid? Do you use crystalloid? Um, and how do you define a positive response? Is it a 5% increase in cardiac output, a 10% increase? And how do you measure that? Is it a flow track? Is it thermal dilution? Is it echo? Um, you can see that the, the number of ways that these studies um, vary and then interact and try to come together in a meta-analysis are super complex. And we could spend over a single lecture just diving into one of these meta-analyses. I'm not gonna be doing that. I just wanna give you a sense of the complexity of this. Um, but what I'm gonna do is just basically uh, hit on the punchlines and the take-home points. And I have all of the studies referenced in the slides for anybody who wants to delve in further into any particular study. So let's start off with a question. Uh, you are treating a 57-year-old female. She's got septic shock from urinary source gram-negative bacteremia. She's intubated. Uh, she has uh, vent needs of 12, 430, and 5. She's met all of her six-hour bundle requirements for sepsis. Uh, she has a CVP of 11, but she's hypotensive on 25 of Levo. So what is the most appropriate intervention regarding fluid administration? Uh, noting that we are online and probably uh, have a higher threshold than normal. If I don't get an answer uh, via chat or out loud in about 30 seconds, I'll just give you that time to consider and then we'll go forward. I would say that uh, probably passive leg raise is going to be your answer here. You don't want to defer further fluids necessarily de facto just because the CVP is 11, and I hope to convince you of that throughout this lecture. Uh, there's certainly evidence for serial lactate with Jones 2010 and capillary refill serially with like the Andromeda shock trials, but you don't want to give the bolus and then figure it out. You want to know a priori if it's going to help. So I would argue that B and C aren't necessarily correct. And D is a measurement that we will call a static measurement as we go forward. Um, and I hope to convince you that probably the active um, evaluations are the best way to go in the future. Uh, so trends today, if you take home one thing, uh, passive is quickly becoming a trend toward active as far as trying to figure out whether or not someone is uh, going to be fluid responsive. And as I've already mentioned, we're moving from invasive to less invasive modalities. So let's talk about static measurements real quick. Uh, they are helpful indicators of cardiac preload, but unfortunately not uh, preload responsiveness. And I'll show you that via some Frank Sterling curves on the next slide. I will say they still have use. Uh, they are definitely a marker of preload, which is one of our main determinants of cardiac function. Uh, and it's certainly the one determinant of organ perfusion. Remember our MAP minus CVP. 
We know that high CVP is associated with all kinds of outcomes, AKI, acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, a number of other um, poor outcomes. Um, and so it certainly has use, but it has fallen out of favor uh, in its own right or by itself to uh, guide further fluid resuscitation after initial boluses are given. Um, so what's the crux of the, uh, the issue here? Well, you don't really know what kind of frank Sterling curve your patient has a priori based just on a CVP. And if your patient's on this curve down on the bottom and you give them increased preload, you may see minimal to no response in cardiac output or stroke volume versus somebody who runs on this uh, frank Sterling curve, you give them that same preload change and they see a large significant response in stroke volume and cardiac output. Um, and CVP, unfortunately, can't tell you where the curve is. They can only give you an estimate of kind of where they are here, but not uh, what kind of response they will have after the bolus is given. So what we'd love to do is assess this response, see if my patient's going to have this insignificant response, or are they going to have this large response without actually giving them the fluid that we know could be harmful, especially if they're not going to respond. And so what we'll see is preload challenge, and we're going to spend the rest of the lecture going through the different ways that we can create uh, preload challenges without giving fluid, or if we do give fluid, giving a very minimal amount of fluid. Okay, we're trying to know things a priori rather than uh, post hoc. So central venous pressure, uh, again, we talked about why it's limited. I will say there's significant controversy for a, numer uh, excuse me, a number of reasons. I'm not going to be going into that. I will uh, suffice it to say that the surviving sepsis guidelines definitely have come against it as a single uh, measurement. So they state that the use of CVP alone, I highlight alone because I think it still has use, especially in conjunction with things with, like uh, bedside cardiac ultrasound, uh, but the use of CVP alone to guide fluid resuscitation can no longer be justified for that body. Uh, there is definitely significant evidence that CVP does not predict fluid responsiveness. Again, this is a CVP number alone, not looking at the waveform or using other adjuncts to help you interpret it. Uh, but the meta-analysis quoted here was 43 studies over uh, 1,100 patients, and they looked at a CVP before and after a fluid challenge, and they compared it to cardiac index uh, after that challenge. There were 57% uh, of patients within this study here that uh, were fluid responders, or excuse me, fluid responders. Uh, it was about half and half as far as ICU versus OR patients. There was no heterogeneity in the study. And the area under the curve for CVP was only 0.56, and the correlation coefficient was only 0.28. Uh, and so not very great numbers for letting you know um, how your patient may or may not respond to a fluid bolus in its own right. Uh, this uh, second study here went even further uh, where they looked at CVP numbers. Because a lot of people say, yeah, normal CVP or high CVP, not particularly useful. But if it's low, it's got to be useful. We know that patient must need fluids. Um, and this study actually kind of uh, refuted that. Um, and so here we see uh, R is responders and NR is non-responders. And what it was is a meta-analysis of 51 studies trying to use CVP to predict, predict fluid responsiveness. The authors of this meta-analysis actually contacted all of the primary authors on the, uh, on the, uh, the studies that informed this meta-analysis and got the individual CVP numbers for each patient so that they could group them into less than eight, eight to 12, or greater than 12. Uh, and unfortunately, the area under the curve crossed 0.5 uh, for intermediate and for greater than 12. Um, so these were essentially uh, useless statistically. Uh, and even in the group less than eight, um, the, there was no predictive value greater than 65%, no likelihood ratio uh, above 2.04 for any CVP 0 to 20, even in these low ones less than 8, although there was at least some correlation that was usable in the less than 8. And this is specifically in the absence of people who didn't have things that we know make CVP inaccurate uh, because it's a pressure rather than a volume, such as right heart failure or tricuspid regurgitation. Uh, so here's just a um, 
another table from that same study, you can see even at a CVP of zero, the positive predictive value, negative predictive value, and positive likelihood ratios are not actually that strong. Um, so even for low CVPs, um, both surviving sepsis guideline in this study note that it's probably not a good indicator in its own right uh, for fluid responsiveness. So what are we gonna do then? We're gonna move away from passive uh, fluid indicators to inform our fluid boluses in the future. So what uh, all the major bodies say is that kind of what's true of CVP is probably true of all static indicators. They're all limited by the Frank Sterling curve that we already talked about. They don't allow for assessment of how the body will respond to that preload challenge. And they certainly don't take into effect the complicated interactions between ionotropy and chronotropy to that afterload, uh, or sorry, to that, uh, that preload challenge. Um, so things like CVP, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, LV and diastolic dimension, Doppler corrected flow time, and many others are falling out of favor. And we're going to be moving to active things like passive leg raise, mini fluid challenges, and ventilation induced variations. This is what we're going to go through here in the rest of the lecture. Um, there's also a sense that this, these measurements don't really give us a good sense of biventricular preload. Um, whereas these measurements do give us a sense of biventricular preload changes. Uh, bolded are the ones that are probably the most common, have the most data behind them. Um, so the question now, you're treating a 57-year-old female, that same female with the urinary source gram negative bacteremia, except for this time she's got ARDS um, and she's on ARDSnet ventilation. She similarly met all her six-hour bundle requirements and is still hypotensive. And we want to ask what's the best way for her to respond to fluids. All right. Um, and so I would say the answer here is going to still be passive leg raise, which is going to be a theme throughout the remainder of our lecture for the next half hour or so. Um, these are all dynamic measurements. Um, so they're moving away from the static and toward the dynamic. Uh, but I hope to convince you through the remainder of this lecture that probably stroke volume variation, pulse pressure variation, and IVC distensibility index aren't particularly great in people who have ARDS with low compliance and typically also low tidal volume ventilation. Um, and a fluid challenge may not be the best thing for somebody who's already uh, experienced a lot of lung water. Um, and hopefully the passive leg raise by the end of this lecture, I can convince you would likely be the right answer on the boards as well as uh, in my mind on how to manage this patient. Um, what we're gonna go through now is kind of how we take care of these patients using these active um, uh, assessments of preload challenge or volume expansion challenge. First off, uh, we're gonna basically whiz through this uh, there, uh, anybody with circulatory failure uh, is going to have low blood pressure or low cardiac output with signs of tissue hyperperfusion are people we're going to assess to see maybe they'll uh, respond to fluids. Anybody, as I said earlier, who has obvious fluid loss or who's in that initial phase of sepsis, they're getting fluids. These are not the people we're talking about. We're again talking about the people who have already uh, received their six hour bundle, they've already had their 30 cc per kg bolus, and now we're trying to see, is there still preload responsiveness? And there's basically three main questions you ask yourself. Are they spontaneously breathing? Are they in arrhythmia? Or are they in ARDS with low tidal volume, low compliance? If yes, you're going down this pathway, and we're gonna do a passive leg raise, an end expiratory occlusion test, or a mini fluid challenge if we need to. If no, those same three tests are also acceptable. So again, you'll see passive leg raise tends to work in almost all situations and has very good data behind it. But if you can say no to those three questions, you can probably use pulse pressure or stroke volume variation. And you additionally can probably use the IVC or SVC. Although we'll see it's not quite as accurate. You'll see this little asterisk here. And this little asterisk says that you can actually use this one despite arrhythmias. Okay, so that's what that asterisk is. So passive leg raise. I'm gonna start with this one because it's probably uh, the most important. Uh, having just completed my boards, it's the one that SEEK loves and it's the one that the boards loves to ask about. And in reality, it's probably the best uh, test I think as well, uh, given the literature that I've reviewed. It mimics a 250 to 350 cc uh, fluid bolus challenge. And it does so obviously without giving a drop of fluid. Uh, 
The problem is it's pretty transient. The maximum effect is seen within 30 to 90 seconds. And so you require a real time monitor. So something like our Pulse, Pulse Contour Vigileo, um, you can do Echo. Hey, there's a number of things you can do, but you have to have something real time. Thermal dilution is not gonna uh, work quick enough to do a pre and post um, with this type of maneuver. There is very good accuracy uh, for fluid responsiveness. Uh, the meta-analyses uh, are, are very in support. Uh, the one that I'll quote to you is a 23 study meta-analysis with over a thousand patients. It had 53 fluid, excuse me, 53% fluid responders. It had fluid responders. It had a pooled sensitivity of 86%, a specificity of 92%, and a very good area under the curve of 95%. Uh, it worked whether, no matter what mode of ventilation you were in, whether or not the patient was spontaneously breathing, no matter what kind of fluid you used, and whether you started the patient in a supine or a semi-recumbent position. So the starting position from the passive leg raise didn't really matter. Uh, there was another meta-analysis that basically mirrored those findings um, and had, honestly, a lot of the same studies included. So it's not uh, uh, particularly shocking that there are two meta-analyses that show about the same thing. Uh, but good, good data behind this. Um, how do we do the passive leg raise? There's a number of ways you can do it. Um, Monet is one of the main uh, proponents of this, and I kind of like his approach the best uh, because it should be a passive leg raise. Um, there are concerns when you raise somebody's legs. Do you wake them up and create some endogenous catecholamines because you lead to pain or discomfort uh, when you're raising their legs? Do you perhaps change the systemic vascular resistance because you're kinking, uh, you know, the vessels at the hips? And so, you know, the common iliacs are creating an increased SVR, similar to somebody who's like in a tet spell, right? They bend over and hug their knees when they're in a tet spell to try to increase their SVR. Um, and so there's a lot of legitimate concerns about just grabbing somebody's feet and trying to lift them up uh, while they're uh, laying there supine. What Monet says is, keep them at 45 degrees, keep them passive in the bed, and instead tilt the bed. That way we're not changing any systemic vascular resistance by trying to uh, bring the legs up. And we're also not leading to any pain or discomfort as we move the legs. We're not agitating the sedated patient, um, which could lead to endogenous catechols that will make the cardiac output increase and make it look like a positive test when in reality it really isn't. Um, so instead you just use the bed, you bring them down, you use a real-time cardiac output monitor. You assess to see if the cardiac output went up with your maneuver. And then you bring them back to the initial position and you make sure that it went back down when you removed the passive leg raise. If it does, then you have pretty good evidence that they probably would be fluid responsive. And then you give them their volume expansion. The other things that he'll say as kind of pro tips is to make sure to suck, suction any secretions before you do this, because as you bring them down, they may have secretions that again would lead to coughing and discomfort that could throw off the uh, cardiac output measurements. And if someone's awake, definitely warn them before they do this, because uh, you can get some endogenous catechols by being flipped uh, backward, obviously. Uh, and he also recommends watching the heart rate as you do the maneuver. The heart rate really shouldn't change too much. Um, and if it does, if it increases specifically, it's concerning that something about that passive leg raise increased sympathetic stimulation rather than purely reflecting just the change in preload. Um, so watching the heart rate is a good pro tip there. What is uh, the passive leg raise validated for? As I said, spontaneously breathing patients, patients in arrhythmia, low tidal volume uh, ventilation, and low lung compliance. So a lot of the patients that we treat, especially these days in the COVID pandemic. Uh, so it's nice that it works for those patients. Uh, obviously not in our prone patients, but uh, you have a good window every day uh, where you can at least do the passive leg raise when they're not prone. Where is it not validated? Basically in anything that increases your uh, sympathetic tone leads to endogenous catecholamines. So if you have uncontrolled pain, cough, discomfort, or the patient's awake and kind of agitated, it's not gonna work. Uh, uncontrolled intracranial hypertension for obvious reasons, you're not gonna be dropping them uh, head down. Uh, hip and leg fractures, uh, if you're going to grab the feet and just kind of push them up, obviously kind of contraindicated. But if you do uh, Monet's technique in the bed, I would say you could even do the passive leg raise uh, with someone with a hip or leg fracture because the joints aren't actually moving, just the bed is. And then the big one is abdominal hypertension. 
It's not very common, thankfully, but it will give you a false negative on the passive leg raise because it doesn't allow um, the blood from the legs and from the splanchnic circulation to get back to the heart, uh, specifically the right side of the heart because the uh, hypertension in the abdomen prevents that return. Um, so in an abdominal hypertension patient, that's the one time where passive leg raise is probably gonna fail you. You're gonna have to look for other modalities. Um, so question next is, uh, what parameter would be most reliable for assessing the response to a passive leg raise? Not hearing any answers, I'll go ahead and argue that probably cardiac output is the right way to look at this. And I'd say it's probably the least common way to do it. As when I was a fellow, I was going to everybody's bedside, I was pushing their ankles up and I was looking at their blood pressure on an arterial waveform. Um, but unfortunately the evidence doesn't back it, may make us feel better, um, but uh, cardiac output is probably the evidence-based way to do it. So how do we assess? Um, less reliable things are gonna be heart rate, blood pressure, and pulse pressure variation with good data behind them. Uh, likely SVV and SVI as well, which is stroke volume variation. Um, and then the um, same correlate of that with the um, pulse oximeter, which we'll talk about in a second. These three all kind of work the same. They're not reliable ways in the meta-analyses to uh, predict fluid responsiveness. I won't go into the details, but I'll have you take my word on that. Uh, reliable things are going to be esophageal and transthoracic echo, which we'll go through, pulse contour analysis, as we talked about earlier, and bioreactants, uh, which again is not commonly used, uh, at least that I've seen at Henry Ford. Promising things are end tidal carbon dioxide, which would be pretty easy and non-invasive to watch, uh, but it is not ready for prime time. The studies that have supported that are at high risk for bias in the meta-analyses that have been done on them. Um, and under investigation, our peak velocity of the carotid femoral arteries. Um, so literally just putting your uh, cardiac, dot, or excuse me, not cardiac, but your uh, Doppler ultrasound probe uh, over the vessel and just seeing how the peak systolic velocity changes during the passive leg raise. If it goes up, that suggests that you have a better stroke volume. Um, and there's even been a study done on capillary refill that had pretty promising results. It's kind of inspired by Andromeda shock. There's a bunch of others under investigation, but for now, the true evidence base uh, on the meta-analyses that I've reviewed are your echo correlates and then pulse contour analysis and bioreactants. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick second to talk about how we do this with echo because it's super useful at bedside, especially when you don't have invasive lines yet. Um, I just took a care of a patient in the emergency department uh, two days ago, actually, who looked like florid heart failure with flash pulmonary edema, uh, ended up with a lactate of five. We had no limes in the gentleman, but had a fever of 38.5. I was about ready to diuresum and afterload reduce him with nitroglycerin, but the fever made us take pause, saying maybe he's septic. Uh, and we did this uh, maneuver at bedside to assess a passive leg raise with no invasive uh, techniques. We saw that he had a very good response to fluid responsive uh, to the passive leg raise. We actually gave him antibiotics and gave him a 30 cc per kg bolus, despite having pitting edema to the sacrum, uh, ascites from right heart failure, uh, and not having taken any of his cardiac meds in two months because he didn't like doctors. Well, sure enough, he actually responded to the 30 cc per kg bolus he uh, cleared his lactate from about five to normal, and he ended up having gram-positive uh, bacteremia from his edematous legs uh, that led to direct invasion of the gram-positive bacteria. Um, all able to do this at bedside in less than two minutes. Um, so I do think it's worth the time to uh, talk about this. Um, and I know the fellows have seen this uh, in our ultrasound simulation sessions. Um, but what we do uh, is we very quickly get an apical five view on the uh, cardiac ultrasound. And that looks like this. And all we do is uh, basically train our continuous, uh, excuse me, our pulse wave Doppler right at the aortic valve. And we measure the velocity time integral or VTI, which gives you a flow of, through the aorta that ends up looking something like this. Um, and then when you're pairing along axis, you just measure the aortic root diameter. The computer in the uh, echoes that we have, the sonocytes, will take this diameter and give you a cross-sectional area. And they will take this uh, velocity time uh, integral and create a, uh, a stroke volume for you. So what does it look like? 
basically like this in real life. And how does it work? Well, you take your aortic uh, diameter. Again, the computer will use the diameter to give you a circumference, which gives you the cross-sectional area. And then the computer will do the integral of a velocity and basically give you the stroke distance. And so if you take a stroke distance times the cross-sectional area, that gives you the stroke volume. All you have to do is multiply that by the heart rate and you have cardiac output. There is an, a wonderful four minute, five, uh, four minute video on five minute sano uh, that explains all of this. Uh, for anybody who has more interest or who can't remember from our uh, ultrasound sim, I would recommend uh, linking to that video. All right, so that's passive leg raise. We're gonna quickly now go to uh, mini fluid challenge and later on go to end expiratory occlusion test. Um, when do we use the uh, end expiratory occlusion test versus the mini fluid challenge test? Um, there is some guidance here. You'll see this is another uh, author, Messina, but his pathway is even easier than the one above here. Um, long story short, if passive leg raise works, just use it. And I would agree with that uh, as well. Passive leg raise doesn't work, uh, then fluid uh, responsiveness is unlikely. But if you can't do passive leg raise, so you have that rare patient with intra-abdominal hypertension or uncontrolled pain or hip fractures or you know, increased intracranial hypertension, uh, you have to decide how else you're gonna assess. And probably the best way per the studies that I've seen is to use either the mini fluid challenge test in somebody who is spontaneously breathing or on assisted um, uh, ventilation or the end esophageal occlusion test in anybody who is on a CMV or a vented essentially. You're gonna look for a stroke volume or cardiac output increase of greater than 10% to assess responsiveness in that setting. So the mini fluids uh, challenge, uh, long story short, there's no defin uh, standard definition for mini. The studies run anywhere from honestly 50 to uh, 500 cc's, almost anywhere from one minute to 30 minutes. There's a study that shows that four cc's per kg is probably the optimal fluid threshold for uh, making sure that you get a reliable uh, result in all patients. Um, but there have been, like I said, as low as 50 cc bolus is given. Um, the data behind them is, is reasonably good. Uh, you have meta-analyses with upwards of 85 studies and 3,600 patients um, that show very good areas under the curve up to 0.91, sensitivity of 82% and specificity of 83. Um, the problem is there is no consensus among those studies of like what a positive response is, but probably it's a likely an increase in cardiac output of greater than or equal to 10%. Um, sorry, we talked about the test characteristics already. Um, those meta-analyses specifically show that there's not an effect based on the type or the volume of fluid. Um, so the one meta-analysis that I looked at showed uh, about as good data at 100 cc's as uh, at 500 cc's. Um, however, the lower volumes were given closer to like the one, two minute range, whereas the higher volumes were given more in the five to 10 minute range. So there's some heterogeneity here. Um, the study that quoted this four cc's per kg, I should have mentioned, uh, infused that volume over about five minutes. Uh, so again, it's tough because of how different these studies are done, but all of the studies using their different thresholds and uh, methods were all very uh, positive studies with very good uh, area under the curve. So it's probably a way to go. The main drawback behind this is obviously you can't do a bunch of mini fluid challenges throughout the day. It's labor intensive and it can also lead to um, fluid overload, especially if you do a bunch of 500 cc mini fluid bolus challenges in a given day. Uh, the studies do show that you definitely decrease accuracy after 30 minutes. Um, and so you, because it's a quick um, response, it's more amenable to real-time cardiac output, like we talked about Doppler, pulse contour analysis, et cetera. There's even data on a mini fluid challenge test, and that test uh, decreases the threshold from 10% to 5%. Uh, so we're back to our 57-year-old female with septic shock from urinary source gram-negative bacteremia. She is not an ARDS in this case. She's gotten her six hour bundle requirements. She has that CVP of 11. She's still hypotensive on 25 of Levo uh, and she's an AFib. So the most appropriate way now to uh, decide on further fluids is 
And I would argue IBC distensibility index uh, because the other three answers are all gonna be made invalid with arrhythmia as we're gonna talk about here in the last couple minutes. Um, so now we've gone through this pathway, we're gonna uh, hone in on these two extra pathways for people who are uh, not spontaneous, excuse me, who are not spontaneously breathing, who don't have arrhythmia and who uh, potentially uh, don't have ARDS with low tidal volume uh, or low lung compliance. So the ventilation induced variation. IBC, I'm not gonna spend much time on. I think we're all very familiar with it, uh, but in a spontaneously breathing patient, we tend to use a collapsibility index of 50%. Uh, and in our vented patients, we know we do something called a distensibility index instead, and our threshold falls from 50% to 20% uh, in most studies as a quote unquote positive response, likely to respond to further fluids. Um, there is moderate accuracy in spontaneously breathing and vented patients with areas under the curve um, of right in the range of 0.85 or so. Um, and the important thing to remember is what it makes the IBC variation inaccurate. So it's inaccurate with strong or irregular respiratory effort. It's inaccurate in intra-abdominal hypertension, low tidal volume, and low uh, lung compliance. It can, however, unlike pulse uh, pressure variation and stroke volume variation, be used in arrhythmia. The SVC as a side point is likely more accurate than the IBC, and the threshold is uh, still 20%. The problem with the SVC is that uh, you have to have an esophageal Doppler for that, so it's a little bit more invasive. So, our ventilation-induced variations, the last thing we're going to go through is stroke volume and uh, pulse pressure variation. Uh, they're calculated as such. I think we're all reasonably familiar with them. The only thing I want to point out is pulse pressure variation is truly a pulse pressure. It's not a systolic blood pressure variation, which is often uh, something that's followed by residents, uh, but it is in, in, in truly a pulse pressure, not just the systolic pressure variation. Why does it work? Uh, well, there's pretty well described physiology behind it. We know that when we breathe in, we increase transpulmonary pressure. And we know that that will uh, decrease our LV preload. We also increase our intrathoracic pressure, which decreases our LV afterload. The combination of these two things increases our LV stroke volume as we have a mechanically uh, delivered ventilated breath. Um, and so our pulse pressure should be maximum at inspiration. At the same time, we know that same increase in intrathoracic pressure decreases RV preload and the increase in transpulmonary pressure actually increases RV after load. And so at the same time, we have a decrease in RV stroke volume. However, it takes some time for that blood to go from the RV through the pulmonary circuit to the LV. So by the time that's reflected in a decreased LV stroke volume, we're actually expiring and we see that the pulse pressure is minimized at expiration. If these two lined up during inspiration, they would basically cancel each other out. But because of the time it takes the blood to transit the pulmonary circuit here, um, they actually space out nicely. And this is the physiologic basis behind pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. Um, why it's nice is it brings us right back to our Frank Sterling curve that we started the lecture out with is it lets us assess what kind of response we're gonna have for the same preload challenge. Um, a high pulse pressure variation suggesting that we're on this curve and we'll probably have a good response to further fluid and a low pulse pressure variation suggesting that we're likely on this Frank Sterling curve. We probably aren't gonna have much improvement with a um, volume challenge. There's very good accuracy for um, fluid responsiveness with very specific inclusion criteria that we will go through. Uh, but the meta-analyses, including over 800 patients in 22 studies, showed a pool of sensitivity of 88, specificity of 89, and area under the receiver operating curve of 0.94. So pretty good stats. Um, there is a gray zone, and that gray zone is between 9 and 13 percent. And I will note that, unfortunately, the studies done show, and it's true in clinical practice, I feel like as well, is about 25% of values, unfortunately, fall into this gray zone, um, which make it um, somewhat less useful. This is going to look like the same slide. The only thing that's changed is the references, and I put SVV instead of uh, a pulse pressure variation here. It's the same threshold. It's the same reasonably good accuracy, uh, this time with... Uh, 
a area under the receiver operating curve of 0.93, sensitivity and specificity of 0.81 and 0.8 respectively, and that same gray zone that we talked about. So SVV and, and uh, pulse pressure variation are very similar uh, in their test characteristics. There's something called um, the PLEF variability index, which is essentially the same thing as the pulse pressure variation, but using the pulse oximeter. Um, it has some data behind it. It's probably not ready for prime time. It's calculated as such. Um, and it does have reasonable accuracy in the OR where the data is best um, with areas under the receiver operating curve of about 0.8, um, same threshold of 13, a larger gray zone of eight to 20%, and where it's not so useful for us is it's more affected by a bad cardiac output, hypothermia, peripheral vascular disease, and vasoactive drugs, unfortunately. Um, and that's where the data in the ICU is much worse with sensitivity uh, being as low as 0.56 in the ICU versus the OR. So this is more for our anesthesia colleagues than it is probably for our uh, ICU practice. But I'll mention it here because there's a lot of uh, mention of it in the literature. Uh, same inaccuracies as pulse pressure variation, SVV, um, pulse pressure variation, and uh, the PLEF variability index are all kind of based on the same uh, physiology. Um, I'm going to skip this in the um, interest of time. The only thing I wanted to mention is that these perform much better, as you can see with these areas under the curve, than um, our static measurements like CVP and left ventricular and diastolic volume. Um, so the last thing we need to talk about is which of the following conditions uh, might it be acceptable to use pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation? And I would say that of all these, probably the only one that may be reliable is a vasopressor dependence which is the last thing we wanna talk about is when can you use these? I would say the biggest um, problem with SVV and pulse pressure variation is that there are a ton of uh, things that make it inaccurate. Um, with studies showing that as few as like one in five patients in the ICU can actually have these reliably applied to them. So SVV is inaccurate in valvular abnormalities and uh, cardiac shunts, uh, because again, it will throw off the pulse contour analysis that's done to create the SVV and the stroke volume variation. Uh, it is inaccurate for obvious reasons, given the physiology we talked about for spontaneous breathing and cardiac arrhythmia. That is why those are bolded. Um, and what you'll see is that the remainder of these are pretty strong uh, contraindications as well. Low tidal volume, intra-abdominal hypertension, uh, low compliance, high respiratory rate, and that's defined as a respiratory rate. Uh, over, excuse me, a heart rate over a respiratory rate of less than 3.6, uh, and then RV failure and open chest. F plus is positive, F minus is negative. Um, I won't belabor these because they just go back to the physiology that we've already talked about and we're getting short on time. Um, but I uh, will say that, again, the ones in bold are absolute prerequisites. We should not be applying SVV or pulse pressure variation to anybody who's spontaneously breathing or in a cardiac arrhythmia. Um, and then these in asterisks are absolute contraindications to SVV, but you will see not necessarily um, to people with pulse pressure variation. Those two fall, fall out. All right. And then if you're really married to pulse pressure variation, again, uh, passive leg raise is probably the way to go and is much easier. But if you are married to it, um, there is an algorithm to try to use pulse pressure variation um, in people who have certain contraindications like low tidal volume and low compliance. Um, and it's here for anybody who wants to review it afterward. Um, I do think we are running out of time. And so I'm going to stop there. Um, I had some other uh, things just in case we had extra time, but they are less ready for prime time. And I want to make sure we had enough time for SVV and pulse pressure variation. Uh, any questions or concerns? And I want to see if the chat, let's see.
Dr. Rivers uh, and Dr. Peruzzi have given some uh, good references, it looks like. And then um, what would be the number two option in a situation where passive leg raise is not possible due to injury? Um, so again, uh, on that, you're gonna have to use this pathway. Bring this up for you. Um, so if you can't do the passive leg raise, that's where you can choose between the end expiratory occlusion test if you need to. I apologize, I left this off just due to it not being as evidence-based uh, and as well as um, not as frequently used or the mini fluid challenge test. And I think that was it for questions. Any other questions that anybody has? Awesome. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thank you. I don't think there's any more questions in the chat box that I see either. All right.